Good morning. I am Priyanka Naidu and I am a Mama Magic Influencer. I am very excited to be hosting on interviewing Dr. Michael Moore, who will be joining us today at 10 a.m. to discuss the topic of bedwetting. Welcome, thank you for joining. Today's session is going to be extremely exciting and um, please, we would want as much participation as possible and Dr. Moore will be joining us soon to discuss the, the not so often spoken topic of bedwetting today. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Thank you for joining. I'm very excited for today's session. Um, it's going to be extremely insightful and um, it's really, hi Jess Amy, how are you? Thank you all for joining. So, we have Dr. Mo who's just joined. Good morning, Dr. Mo. How are you? Hey, Pri, I'm well. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Pleasure. I see I got the right dress, member. Hey, we're both wearing navy with a yes. V-neck. Mm, <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, Dr. Mo, I just want to introduce myself to you. I'm Priyanka Naidu. I am a Mama Magic influencer and part of the Mama Magic community. And I'm very excited to be chatting to you today about, I would say, not a very popular topic, but very interesting indeed, of bedwetting. It's, it might not be popular, but very important, uh, important Priyanka. And is Absolutely. it Priyanka or Pri? Or, uh, do I, I shorten everyone's name, so just forgive me if I call you Pri. So but it's is Priyanka, Priyanka, but you're more than welcome to call me Pri. <laughs> Thank you. Your friends call you Pri. Yes. Brilliant. So, Dr. Moore, I just want to thank you again for just joining us on this awesome platform of Mama Magic. And as you are familiar with the platform, we are here to help parents on their journey of navigating this a very exciting and often daunting um, journey of parenthood as it's never the same day by day. And um, Dr. Moore, I just want to take an opportunity to introduce you to the moms and dads who are joining us today, even though you are not an unfamiliar face to them because um, you are through our homes over the years. So thank you. Thank you for being that, that uh, familiar face. But Dr. Mo, um, I believe you haven't gone for career counseling and that's why you wear many hats. Um, you are a medical doctor, TV producer, international speaker, author, husband, dad. You, are, you definitely wear many hats and uh, we are very excited to be picking your medical hat today as the um, executive director and founder of Hello Doctor. We are certainly very excited to have you here today. So welcome. Well, Pri, thank you so much. That was a lovely welcome. Thank you for hosting me. Of all those things that you mentioned, I also am a father of three kids, a former bedwetter, wow, and, awesome. and one of my kids are bedwetters too. So not just the medical doctor, but also the parent that's gone through that experience of bedwetting and knows what it's like firsthand. And I think that's probably the most important qualification to be speaking to you this morning. Absolutely. So um, let's get started. So what is bedwetting and what causes bedwetting? So bedwetting, we refer to bedwetting in medical circles as nocturnal enuresis, mostly so that the kids don't understand what the adults are talking about. But a lot of adults don't understand what the adults are talking about. So essentially bedwetting pre is really just, uh, it's defined as the unintentional passage of urine at night. Okay, that's the medical definition with a key emphasis on unintentional. In other words, it's not a child willfully wetting their bed, most important point. The second thing is, uh, what do you need, what needs to be in place for a child to be diagnosed with bed wetting? And I say diagnosis because it sounds, but, but maybe that's the wrong approach because it's not a disease or a condition or, uh, but, but these are the parameters. Firstly, a child must be of an age where we expect their bladders to be mature and controlled at night. And that age is around five. So kids will get mature bladder control or get bladder control at night between the ages of three and six on average. But on five, we kind of say they must at least be five and they must at least be wetting their beds twice a week for us to say, okay, we have a bed wetter on our hands. 
So, Pri, you've got a daughter, I think, of two or three. I'm not sure how old she is at the moment. But if you come to me yes, and say, I my daughter's still. wetting the bed, I'm going, no, she's not, Pri. She's not. We don't expect her to be dry at night yet. So, please don't panic. Don't yeah. worry. At least five years of age, at least twice a week. And then you have a child so, who's a bed wetter. Dr. Maud, what stage would it become a concern for parents um, in terms of the regularity and the period of bed wetting? What is more or less normal? for a bed wetter in childhood development? So every child is different. You know that. I have three of them. There's no book that says this is the book for the child. So every child matures differently. All right. As I said, you between three and six, most kids will develop uh, sort of nighttime bladder control. But it depends on your child as to when you intervene and how you intervene. All right. Very important. You can have a child who at the age of five is wetting their bed at night and it is destroying their lives. They just cannot, they are stressed. There's anxiety, there's withdrawal. They don't go and play with friends. They don't have sleepovers. Uh, that's when you intervene early and quickly, proactively. But you could have a child who's seven and who wets their bed at night. And as a family, the parents are kind of going, it's part of, it's a natural part of growing up. It's not an issue. And the child isn't bothered in the least, you know, talks about it, whatever the case is, you, you get those kind of kids. And those kids, you don't proactively manage. Uh, you can just treat them conservatively or manage them conservatively until they get to the age of seven. And I think from a medical perspective, if your child is seven or older and still wetting the bed at night, that's worth a visit to your pediatrician or your GP or even a urologist. So I would say that's the scope. What, what do we do? Okay. It depends on our child and how it's affecting my child. And at the age of seven, if nothing else has happened, still wetting their bed, I would get a doctor involved. But before then, I don't think that's necessary. Great. I love what you just said that it's such a personal journey, just as um, we are all created unique. I mean, every child is different. Um, one may just, you know, not be interested at all. And the other may just be feeling very embarrassed, um, concerned, anxious, and also embarrassed. So how can parents support their child during this journey? Well, firstly, I would, I would tell my child, you're not alone. I mean, the statistics in South Africa, Pri, is one in six kids between the ages of five and 10 is wetting their beds at night. One in six. So it's All right, that's common. It's I'm very, not... no, it's very common. I mean, if you think about a child at, in, in class, you know, the class of 24, 25, four or five of that child's friends are also wetting their bed at night. But kids don't talk about yes. that. So they go through this alone. So they're not alone. This, no, and there's the shame and I'm the only one. So the first thing I would tell my kids or your kids if they're wetting their bed, is guys, you know, this is, you're not alone. A lot more kids are going through this. This is not just you. And, and talk about it, engage with them. Don't let them go through this period of bedwetting alone. It's a season. Most kids, and I'm talking 99% of kids, will go through this bedwetting season uh, and come out on the other side without any treatment necessary, without any interventions. I say 99% because statistically 1% of adolescents, so this is 18 and older, are still wetting their bed. And that obviously is a, is a, is a wow. real issue and a, and, a, and a big problem and not for this yes, discussion. Yes, sure. Okay, so that's, there's pathology there. It's so, it's so great to be having this conversation because so mm. often parents tend to keep to themselves or don't have this honest, open conversation with their kids knowing that it's absolutely normal and it's so common. So it's, it's also just so great to know that we're all in this together and, and uh, we can support our child knowing that they will um, often grow out of it and it's nothing to really worry about. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in our family, like I mentioned earlier in the beginning, not, in, not only was I a bedwetter, but I have a child that was a bedwetter. And the rule in the family is just no teasing. And we talk about it. There, there's no shame. There's no kind of sweeping this under the rug. Yes. Hey, man, you're wet your bed. No worries. We'll sort it out. That's all fine. So there, there are many awesome. ways of, of kind of dealing with it. But I think maybe before we get into what parents can do, just a deeper understanding, Pri, if you like, of why my child wets their bed, because that's probably the biggest issue. Yes, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm standing on this platform, waving my hand and saying, parents, you should never, ever, ever, ever punish your child for wetting the bed because it is not their fault. And the reason the child wets their bed, there are three reasons. Firstly, they're making too much urine at night, or they're rather they're not producing a hormone that produces urine production in the evening. It's a hormone called vasopressin. And as you grow up, you, you produce more of the hormone and more of that hormone means less urine production at night. But certain kids aren't producing that hormone or very little of it. So they produce too much urine, bladder gets full and they wet their bed. So that's the first reason, you know, a hormonal one. The second reason is they've just got small bladders. Certain kids have small bladders, like they've got 
small hands, small legs, small whatever, you know. So that small bladder capacity means they can't take a lot of urine and so they wet the bed at night. And the third reason is kids are unable to uh, wake easily in the evenings. I mean, you know, certain kids can just sleep through sirens and just yeah. crazy stuff and they just fall fast asleep and others wake immediately. So that sleep arousal in certain kids is different. So those are the three reasons. Not enough hormones or, you know, uh, you know not, not enough of the hormone that reduces urine production, small bladder capacities and an inability to wake it up. And those three reasons kids cannot control. There's nothing they've done to do that. So to think that your child is being belligerent and, and annoying and frustrating and trying to get me back by waiting his bed and like, I'll show you mom, is not true at all. You could never ever, you should never ever punish a child for waiting their bed. And here's a preamble, I'm and interrupting you, you, sorry. Um... Hmm. I was going to I say think, that, as you mentioned from the beginning, you were just saying that it's completely unintentional and involuntary. I mean, absolutely. something that a child would never choose if they had the option. Um, so, Dr. Mall, thank you so much for those three options. But are there any uh, bedtime routines that parents could enforce or try um, to practice to empower their kids not to wet their beds? Absolutely. So, um, there is a proactive approach and there's a conservative approach. Remember we talked about that earlier. So if it's not bothering your child, just start with a conservative approach to bedwetting. And that really is the stuff that we know as parents inherently, the, the kind of logical stuff. So you limit fluid intake in the evenings, not during the day, all right? You want to give your child as much fluid during the day as possible. You want to increase that bladder capacity, obviously, but two hours before bedtime, you start reducing fluid intake. All right, and if you can minimize it or remove it, wonderful. Most kids want a little bit of a sip or can I have a glass of water, mom? You know, that's fine. Give them a little bit of a sip, but don't give them excessive fluids before they go to bed, obviously. Just before they go to bed, avoid their bladders, you know. Off to the bathroom, empty your bladder, brilliant. And by the way, make it really easy for your kids to get to the bathroom because we don't know this, but there are monsters everywhere. And when a child wakes up at night, they've got to fight through monsters yes. and get through this crazy just to get to the bathroom. So who would want to do that? They'd rather just stay in their bed and with their pants. Yes. So, you know, so please make it easy to, to access kind of the bathroom. And then so, some other some other aspects which have got less of the science behind it, but things like a reduced protein and salt uh, intake for dinner. All right. That that has an effect on uh, you know wetting a bed at night. Salt and protein. Caffeinated drinks. In fact, there's good science behind that. Avoid caffeinated drinks. You're not going to be giving that to your kids anyway, and not at night, I hope. Exactly. But be careful with what you give them because there's certain there's caffeine in certain chocolates, in hot chocolate, in teas. So just be wary of what you're giving your child. Anything caffeinated, you want to avoid. And then something you shouldn't. As parents do this is um, they lift their child. We call it lifting the child. Disturbed so that no one calls me during this call. Uh, a lot of parents uh, forgive the interruption. So parents wake their kids up in the evenings before they go to bed and they take them to the loo. You know, so kid goes to bed at 7.30, 8 o'clock and then at 10, 10.30 when parents go to bed, they take their child to the bathroom. Don't do that. We call that lifting. That actually prolongs the season of bed waiting. Uh, I know sure. it, it makes sense wow. and you kind of think, well, at least I can em empty that bladder just a little bit. Don't do that. It's not a healthy habit. Okay, so those are the conservative treatments. So what to do and what not to do. You're helping your kid by doing it. But you're not. But actually, you're just prolonging it. Sure. Yes, so that's exactly. That's interesting. Eh? Yeah. Wow. So that's that's conservative. All right. And and uh, let's get into the impacts of bedwetting in a moment. Um, the proactive things you can do, and this is when your child is really battling, and when you can see their stress and anxiety and depression. Did you know that depression is hugely significant for kids that wet their beds? Big risk factor. That's when you intervene proactively. And there are really two things you can do proactively. One is bedwetting alarms. And the other is medication, something called desmopressin. It's probably the best medication around at the moment. And really all that does, desmopressin, the medication, for example, is uh, a, a, a variant or a copy of the hormone that your kids should be producing that produces urine production. Um, it's not a treatment. It's not a cure for bedwetting. Because remember, bedwetting is not a disease. All it does is reduce urine production. The night that you take it, it works. As soon as you stop taking it, your child is going to go back to bedwetting. So it really is just helping your child through the, through the season of bedwetting. If they're gonna go on a sleepover, not a bad idea to give them that. Dry nights, exactly the same. We're talking about absorbent pants. What a great option. I wish those were around when I was, uh, when I was parenting. You know, my kids are wetting their beds because the same thing. 
you know, to have an absorbent uh, pant at night, your child goes to bed, there's no sleep disturbance. There's no anxiety of going to bed wondering, am I going to wake up with wet sheets and worry? And, and if I'm going to be on a sleepover, or if I've got friends sleeping over, can you imagine the panic a child goes to sleep with knowing, I have no control over this. If I wake up in wet sheets, what are my friends going to say? I mean, it's, it's awful. So to have something like uh, a desmopressin and a medication or like an absorbent pant is wonderful just to reduce the stress associated with bedwetting. So Absolutely, those, so, because and, I mean... And Priya, I'm interrupting, sorry, one more time. So maybe just to kind of connect those two. So if you think of the three causes of bedwetting, so much to say about this subject. Three causes of bedwetting, uh, if, if it's a hormonal deficiency or not, not enough hormone that you're producing, then obviously medication works. If a child has an inability to wake up at night with a full bladder, then alarms tend to work. But of the two, alarms and medication, you need to know parents that they're effective in around two thirds of kids. So just a third of kids won't respond to either of those. And that's just kind of the luck of the draw. All right. And beyond and that, goes, that, that's um, to still speaking not... speaking to how unique and different our kids are. Absolutely. Yeah. So Dr. So, Noel, thank you for that. But um, sure. just in terms of when a parent should actually seek advice from a medical expert or their pediatrician, when is that time that they actually should be concerned? Okay, so we mentioned it earlier, seven years or older, probably a good time to go and see a pediatrician, but then your child really should have bladder maturity. Um, there are two kinds of bedwetting. There's primary and secondary. Primary bedwetting, and when I talk about bedwetting, this is nocturnal, you know, enuresis, nighttime bedwetting. Primary is around 70% of cases, 75% of cases, and we define it like that if a child has never been dry at night and continues to wet the bed, that's primary. Secondary bedwetting, around 25% of cases, that's when your child has been dry for at least six months and starts to wet their bed again. All right. Those causes of bedwetting are unlikely to be hormonal or you know, the size of bladder or arousal. That usually tends to have other complications, things like parental discord, you know, fighting, divorce possibly, a new sibling, <laughs> bullying at school. Uh, it's often associated with some other conditions, diabetes, and maybe even constipation. So there are other things to look out for. So if you have secondary uh, nocturnal enuresis or bedwetting, that's probably worth taking to a doctor. And if your child is over the age of seven, also worth taking to a physician. And then finally, if you've tried medication and you've tried bedwetting alarms, you've tried all those things and your child is still wetting their bed at night and it is affecting them psychologically, that's definitely worth taking to a doctor. Absolutely. Um, so what I'm hearing, just um, a common thread, is um, just to be there for your kids, to reinforce um, and reassure them that it's okay and what you're going through is yeah. perfectly normal, and that there, are, there is help available to our parents and to kids who are experiencing unusual after the age of seven bed waiting. Um, Dr. Moore, I came across um, something when I was reading about this topic because it did it really interest me. I mean, I, I'm a bed waiter. I wait I wait my bed a few times as well, just to be honest here. Um, it was very random. Um, but there can be certain triggers um, that would be called a late onset um, that could possibly cause your kid to be um, a late bed waiter. How do we deal with that? And when, do, when can parents notice and take action when it comes to late onset bedwetters? So what you're referring to there, Pri, is exactly what you talked about earlier, is the secondary bedwetting. So your child was dry, and then they start to wet their bed again. And that often has a psychological component. As I mentioned, you know, the parental divorce or yes. bullying or, you know, pressures at school, anxiety. And that's often treated best, not physiologically. In other words, you know, Medication, bedwetting alarms aren't going to solve the issue. The issue is getting to the root of the problem. What's causing that anxiety? What's causing that stress? Um, and that's really important. I, I want to dial back to a moment for, to something you said earlier. And you said that you know the, the common threads are coming through about supporting a child. So very important. The biggest thing with bedwetting is not having dry sheets at night. I mean, that's just something you can clean and wash and, you know, put in a tumble dryer, hang out outside. Absolutely. The biggest issue with bedwetting is the psychological impact on your child. There are, there are five things that affect your child when it comes to bedwetting. The first thing is a high risk of depression. I mean, believe it or not, kids that wet their beds are at risk for depression later on in life, which is crazy. In fact, I mean, I talked about one in six kids wet their beds at night. Uh, the statistic for anxiety and depression in South Africa is also one in six. I'm not saying it's directly linked to bedwetting, but it is prevalent and it's profound. 
And interestingly, interestingly enough, if you lift your child, we talked about what not to do. If you are lifting your child, that increases the chance of you know, prolonged bedwetting, but also increases the chance of depressive symptoms. So again, another reason not to lift your child in the evenings and wake them up. So depression is a big thing. Self-image is another. Kids who wet their beds undervalue themselves compared to their peers. They perform, perform generally poorly at school. And for no reason, you know, these are clever kids. There's no reason they should perform poorly, but it's just because they wet their beds and psychologically the self-image is poor. I value myself poorly. And as a result, I perform poorly. So those are the major, big, big issues. Obviously, there's sleep disturbance and all that stuff that comes with it. But those two things are so key. So as parents, if you have a bedwetting child, you need to know that. You need to be focusing on those issues and not worry so much about, you know, the, the, the wet sheets. It's the psychological issues that really need your attention and your support and your focus. So, and the other thing, please, 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 I've said this many times, and I'm going to probably say it more times before the end of this Insta Live uh, discussion, Pre, is that never, ever should you as a parent ever, 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 ever punish your child for wetting their bed. That's, that's a bit like looking at a child and going, hey, you've got blue eyes, you get a hiding. I mean, wetting their bed has got nothing to do with a child. It's the, there's no willful disobedience. It's out of their hands. Please never punish them. And, Absolutely. you know, parents do. 50% um, of parents still punish their kids, 50%. In fact, there's a, there's a story of a, um, uh, someone in Polesmore prison, uh, a, a chaplain was telling this story of a prisoner who came to him and said, as a kid, his parents would make him, if he wet his bed, stand behind their door all night, winter, summer, you name it, in his shorts, if he wet his bed to punish him. Now, I'm not saying that's why I became a oh, hardened criminal and rising in port, but it is. Absolutely. And in fact, another parent, and then I'll stop with these parenting stories because sometimes just you know, I get shivers thinking about it. Uh, a, 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 a gentleman came yeah, to me. Actually, said, you know goosebumps thinking yeah, about it. A guy came to me after a presentation that time. He said, "You know, Dr. Moll, um, my mom, my parents, let's say not mom, my parents would, if I wet my bed, would take me to school in the bucky with the mattress on the back of the bucky to show everyone the wet spot to try and get me to stop. That was their attempt, and." I'm sure parents mean well and they're desperate to get through the season, but that just destroys a child's self-confidence. So please don't do that. Be the supportive parent. Be the parent that says, my child, we get through this. It's just a season. I love, I love that how, you know, you really, really went down deep and brought to the, to really go down to the root cause and how we can impact kids into their entire life in terms of their self-worth, the, um, the ability to overcome, um, because it can become traumatic for a kid that sure. can manifest in so many other areas of their lives. And, and I can talk about this just because I'm a life coach and I'm really interested in just helping people from that perspective as well. So to encourage parents to know their children, get to know their children and support them, knowing that mm -hmm. it's a loving environment and they're not going to be judged for this. Yeah. Neither does it define them is so important. So thank Absolutely. you for highlighting that because when it comes to emotional support and emotional um, well-being, of kids it doesn't often come naturally as a parent mm. even though we are geared for that we just want to find a quick solution but it's yeah. so important to be that emotional support more than just washing the linen putting it out and making a big deal it's just really loving on your kid and and teaching them and, yeah. and telling them it's something they're just going to get over and it doesn't define them so yeah. thank you dr moore that's, that's sure awesome. i mean my parents I, and again that's that's why i'm doing what i'm doing because parents don't know this and so part of what you're doing pre and mama magic and what dry nights is doing is educating parents because when i used to wet my bed at night my parents would wake me up make me wash my sheets and dry them before i went back to bed you know and it was their way of kind of going hey buddy you can't keep doing this this affects everybody and but it's because they don't know. So this is not to make you as a parent feel guilty. This is not to pass judgment on parents that have punished the kids. Absolutely. It's to say, hey, guys, now that you know, please don't ever punish your child for something they have no control over. Awesome. And, you know, it's just so great to have a platform such as Mama Magic and have you, I mean, being a public figure and medical doctor and the influencer that you are to just be so real and, and, and know that it's normal and we all go through these things. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, you may be a bed or so you may be going through something quite insignificant in a larger grand scheme of life that doesn't really define you and you can still accomplish great things. Well, you know, there was a Congress recently, Pri, of, I think, 300 doctors. And the conference was all about the wet child. 25% of that group of doctors were all bedwetters. So if you have a child as a bedwetter, there's wow. a 25% chance that they might become doctors one day. You know, <laughs> how's that, that for butchering awesome. statistics? 
<laughs> or, and also wear as many hats as you do. So I believe it's, yeah, it's awesome. It's great. And over to, also to overcome something um, that's not really, it, it, it's only as big as we make it. And, and that's what I'm getting from sure. it here is that something that's normal, one in six kids go through it. Uh, we just have to love on our kids during this time, support them. And only if and when it becomes um, something that's irregular or after a certain age, or if it's accompanied by maybe a UTI or other sort of health issues should be be concerned. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, you, you brought that's up a UTI. Maybe an important point to make there is that um, parents, a couple of questions I often get asked. One is, um, does potty training affect bed wetting at night? Uh, and again, something more to make us as parents feel guilty. You know, I, I messed up potty training, so now my kid's probably wetting the bed at night. The answer is no, there is no connection between potty training and how well it went and bed wetting at night, all right? Daytime incidents, very different from nighttime incidents. Daytime incidents, there's control, there's understanding, there's, you know, you don't need to be wakened from sleep. Nighttime, very different. So I say that if your child is having daytime incidents, you know, uh, very wet underwear, uh, just always going to the loo, you know, seven, eight times a day uh, and wetting their bed at night, that's what we call non monosymptomatic nocturnal enuresis. Big word, it really means it's not just bedwetting, it's bedwetting plus daytime incidents. And that is another reason to go and see your doctor, okay? So what we've largely been talking about is monosymptomatic nocturnal enuresis, which, is, which means your, your child is fine, there's no other issues, just wetting the bed at night. That's the kind of stuff you and I are talking about. If there are daytime incidents, that's when you get a physician involved as well. Awesome. So it's also just to ensure that we are also are in tune with our kids. Um, if there's something, as you mentioned, if there's a life shift or something unusual that's been happening in our lives, that kids often act out in a way um, that's involuntary um, through yeah. their bladders or just acting out. So we just need to pay attention to their behavior and, and yeah. love on them during the, that time of transition. Um, and Absolutely. maybe just sporadic stress. Um, just like lockdown and, and being in a, in a different um, sort of routine, we're all going through something so unusual, something we've never experienced through mm. a crisis like this. So yeah. um, I'm sure kids may, or parents may be experiencing bedwetting during this sure. season. And, and what a great way for a child who otherwise finds it difficult to express emotion or express anxiety or stress. What a great way to pick that up. You know, if my child wasn't wetting their bed, you know, the six month sort of period, and then starts to wet the bed again, immediately red lights go on going, whoop, this is a problem. And it's not a physiological problem. It's more than likely a psychological problem. So it's a, it's a telltale sign. It's kind of a warning to say, hey, your child needs a special attention now. Go and figure out what the issue is and deal with that, the source root of the problem, and the bed wetting will dry up. And I mean, bedwetting, just like any other behavioral sort of tendencies for children to act out or for unusual um, um, circumstances to, to cause kids um, to be just different. I think it's, it's really important um, from what you're saying is for parents to, to really be in tune from an from emotional, psychological perspective, mm. to really be that support and then find help for their kids mm. um, and to not blame them, to not punish them, to not feel that they are the cause because that is furthest thing from, from what it is. Sure. Priya, a quick story for you uh, and, and maybe just yes, to please. kind of uh, hammer home the importance of your influence on your kids. Um, Thomas Edison, that famous inventor, you know, the light bulb, very clever guy. When he was six, I think it was six or seven, he came home from school one day with a letter for his mom. He said, mom, this is a letter that my teachers wrote. They said, only you may open it. Please tell me what does it say? Uh, Thomas Edison's mom opened the letter and got tears in her eyes and she read the letter to him. She said, Tom, the letter says your son is a genius. He is too clever for our school and our teachers. Please, will you teach him? And that's what Thomas Edison's mother did until she passed away. She, she homeschooled Thomas Edison and just invested her time and her life into his education. Uh, and obviously, you know, he went on to become one of the greatest inventors of all time. Later, uh, many years after his mom had passed away, he was going through her stuff and he found that very letter and he opened the envelope and read the letter. And what he found shocked him. The letter said quite the opposite. The letter said, Thomas Edison, your son is mentally deficient. We do not want to teach him in the school. He is expelled. You teach him. And can you imagine wow. if his mother had given him that message, what that would have done to Thomas Edison 
Instead, his mother said quite the opposite, said, you're a genius. And she led him to believe that. And so he wrote in his journal, I, Thomas Edison became the greatest inventor of the, of the 20th century because his mother believed that he was. And I, I share that story wow, with you Dr. because Mark. as parents, sure. yeah, our that impact is quite and profound. our belief. Absolutely profound. Mm. Yeah. Um, and if, we, if bedwetting is not an issue for us, it's belief. not an issue for our children. And that's the, that's the key thing, you know, so. Yes. Yeah. Sure, that actually gave me goosebumps. And it just goes to show the life and um, the life that a mom can speak over their kids, even over a dire mm -hmm. situation or mm -hmm. a, little, um, a little accident, like a bedwetter actually really is insignificant and it doesn't define your worth. And you can Absolutely. overcome and really um, get control of it and grow out of it. It's, it's nothing big. That's awesome. It, it's really been so comforting talking about this, this issue. And just to know that um, it doesn't define our worth, our self-worth and who we are. And as parents, we are all in this together. Um, we ourselves could be bedwetters. We may have our yeah. own bedwetters, but it's something we grow out of and actually can get closer through by seeing your child grow through and love on them during that mm. time. So Dr. Moore, just from... Um, um, Product-wise, you mentioned um, they, there's medication that could be available for for for, for bedwetters and um, little um, sort of comfort pants to wear, or I'm yeah. not sure we, what are the term. We call them absorbent pants. So in terms of um, interventions, we talked about the medication. We talked about the bedwetting alarms. Interesting about the medication that works immediately. So as soon as you take that little pull, it will work. Bedwetting alarms generally take three to four months to really kick in and have an effect and require a lot of motivation because it's not only your child that gets woken up and aroused, it's your, uh, you know, the rest of the family that happens. Um, as far as absorbent pants are concerned, really, really helpful. I mean, these are quiet, they're discreet, they're, they're not bulky. So your, your boys especially, and they're obviously boys and girls variants. Um, by the way, boys are twice as likely to be affected by bedwetting as girls are. We don't know why, so don't ask me that, but that's wow. just statistically sure. two times more boys than girls. But these absorbent pants are great because they kind of go under pajamas, uh, they're discreet, they can't be seen, they're quiet, they're super absorbent. And so um, I, I used the illustration of going out on sleep outs. You know, if your son is, is already kind of going, no, I just don't feel like it, or no, it's not for me, or no, I don't want to be with them. Again, red flag goes up, what little boy doesn't want to go out and sleep out? Uh, and if it is because of the bed wetting, then something like a dry nuts absorbent pants are just brilliant to take away that stress and anxiety. And again, it's you wake up in the mornings and you don't have a wet sheet, but you might have a wet absorbent pant, get rid of it. No one knows any better and carry on with your day. So yeah, awesome. super valuable. I, awesome. I said to you earlier, I, was, I so wish those were around when my kids were wetting their beds. I know, right? <laughs> so you wouldn't have to have uh, washed all those, <laughs> those sheets in your time. Yeah. <laughs> um, when it comes to the medication, um, do parents have to go to a doctor or can they find it at a pharmacy? That would require a script. So you would need to go see your GP to get that medication. And he will explain or she will explain what the dosage is and how many tablets you can use at any given time. You can go up to, I think, three or four, depending on you know, the effect that it has on your child. But yeah, you do that with your GP and that's the best way to do that. Awesome. Great. I think we've covered a whole lot here and we actually, um, you know, got to, to really dig down deep in terms of the true root causes that could lead to bedwetting and for parents really to more than, more than, um, more importantly is to really just be in tune with their kids. Sure, um, absolutely. And, and to be that support that we, yeah. that we often are and, and are needed to be for our kids. And in, never, in, ever, ever too. punish your child for wetting their bed. That's the big message here. You know? And, and Pri, for those who've yes. just joined us, I see a couple of people still joining and, and you kind of come at the tail end of this discussion. Um, I think Dry Nights, I know Dry Nights has got a great website full of information, full of content, videos, if you don't like reading, that just educate you on what bedwetting is all about. And I really encourage you to, to do that, educate yourself, make sure that you know all there is to know about bedwetting and get it from a reputable source. Because the other danger is, and we've seen that with COVID-19, there's just so much information. How much of it is actually yes. true? You know, how much fake news has kind of been coming down at us through this pipe, you know, of the internet. And it's terrifying because it sounds so real and yet it could be so wrong. So when you're looking for information on the web, go to a reputable source for your information. Dry Nights is one such source. I'm sure there are many others, but really want to recommend that you educate yourself if you do have a bedwetter in your home. 
Awesome. Um, so to all the moms and dads online, thank you so much for joining. Are there any questions that you have for Dr. Moore? Uh, we would love to answer them for you. It's awesome to have you on here today. And I'm thoroughly enjoying this conversation with, with you, Dr. Moore. Um, just in terms of- In fact, of, you, in fact I'm interrupting you for a second, Pri, sorry. And there's a bit of a delay, so I do apologize for that. But if you do have questions that we couldn't address on this Insta Live uh, discussion, again, there is a there is a place in drylands where you can go and just ask dr mole uh, that comes straight into our inbox i'd be more than happy to answer those questions if you do have questions that we haven't addressed between the two of us sorry pre you're talking about COVID. oh wonderful um just sorry to get back to dry nights dry night seems to be a great resource available to all parents mm. so yes please log on there to find out more about bed wetting um but i just i wanted to just chat to you thank you so much for your constant um just your constant insight on your twitter feed um just keeping us motivated and uh, um, honest and and you know just inspired over this time because I'm sure it's just something that we all haven't experienced and um, mm. just like bed waiting it can be something that could um, lead to a lot of emotional distress if not handled correctly and the sources that we yeah. get information from is so important as you Absolutely. mentioned. Absolutely. Yeah no I, so Dr. I, I think from sorry Pri I was responding to that yeah and no, again just to reiterate what I said earlier particularly when it comes to COVID uh, you know I got a I got a WhatsApp from my mom-in-law last night saying, "Won't you please listen to this, you know, half-hour presentation before I pass it on? You know, is it true or not?" And I, I mean, I didn't have time to listen to that, but I said to her, "Hey, mom, you know, I have a rule when it comes to information around COVID: don't pass anything on. You know, what makes me the? Why should I pass that information on? If someone really wants information, they need to go and find it in the most reputable places. So, think twice before you just kind of." look at something and that's shocking you just pass it on it could have been a photograph from two years ago it could have been a you know it could have been fake information fake messages whatever the case is why do we need to keep passing these kinds of things on particularly on COVID my sense is just don't you know and if it really is reputable if it comes from a great source and it's important then let your friends and family know but other than that don't be the one that just flicks and passes great absolutely and I think you know we have information at our fingertips. I mean, with anything, we can just go to Google, but we have to really um, be so cognizant of the type of information we do take in on a mm -hmm. daily basis, um, because yeah. it does, it does impact us from an emotional point of view. I mean, we're living in a very, very difficult and unusual time. So to, yeah. to, to give us um, just insight from reputable sources is what we need in terms of any, anything that, that um, we are ingesting mm -hmm. from society and from the media. I think that's a huge point so thank you for that sure and you can uh, stop wearing work. gloves so if you are wearing gloves for COVID yes. no need to do that that's my that's, that's, that's a pet peeve of mine is is you know going grocery shopping and there are people wearing gloves and going guys you know do you understand what you're doing you know the virus gets into your eyes and your nose and your mouth it doesn't get into your skin so if you're wearing gloves sure you touch those surfaces the virus is not going to get into your skin but it gets into your gloves you know and if you're going to touch your face it doesn't matter whether it's with or without gloves, you're still transferring the virus from that surface to your face and that's how you're going to get the disease. So gloves, in fact, gloves are worse because what happens is then you use your gloves, you take them off and you discard them and that becomes another source of the virus for someone else. So, I mean, it's a silly thing, sure. uh, but, but again, whatever you've read about gloves, don't, please don't wear gloves. Leave that, leave that for the professionals and the healthcare practitioners. They need it. Uh, you and I certainly don't. That's, that's such a great tip. So thank you. And I just want to encourage the listeners and if anyone watches this at a later stage to just follow you on Twitter for practical and reputable advice that you give out. So thank you so much. Um, we love you from the Mama Magic community and just the country as a whole for the, for the, for the man that you are. And um, we just want to thank you for this time. Um, thank you. Pri. And thank you yeah. for, for allowing me to actually talk to you on such a, um, as we said, an unpopular, but such an important um, yeah. Um, topic of bed waiting that we just discussed today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for the invite. It was great being hosted by you. And thanks to Mama Magic. I mean, I, uh, we've done a couple of, of our Mama Magic shows throughout the years, and I find it wonderful to kind of engage with parents who have got these beautiful little children who are, you know, starting out in this adventure of parenthood, because that's where the, you know, that's where it all begins. And it's just so wonderful Absolutely. engaging with them. You know, you kind of, the, the hope and the aspirations and what is my child going to be one day and we're going to be great parents. And I love that. It's such a positive energy. So I'm, I'm really sorry for you guys that it's not happening, that COVID has kind of prevented us connecting and rubbing shoulders with you at the expos. 
but uh, as soon as I'm sure it, it, it would be viable to do that, we can open those doors again and we will see you live and in the flesh at Mama Magic. Absolutely. It's been an honor. And um, from us at Mama Magic, I have to say it's not good night because it isn't evening, but it's good day <laughs> and God bless. Lovely to hear it, Pri. God bless you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.